Thank you, thank you, thank you. How can I follow that with like a wonderful radio voice? I'm hi, now welcome to this. I can't do that. I'm just gonna like be myself. Welcome on a Monday morning. Thank everybody for coming. I'm very excited to be here. Um, as you said, I'm Mookie Colhan. Um, this is about the technical future of radio. So we're in this business. We know how things have been changing, and we want to, you know, we know that there's been a lot of debate about what this actual future is, and I think it's important. I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> I think it's important to know and agree that uh, who should be the ones deciding about this future of radio? It's the engineers, right? Who's with me? Engineers deciding radio. OK, let's try this again. <laughs> I'm just going to get back on stage. Technical future of radio. There's been a lot of debate. Who should be the ones to decide about the technical future of radio? It's the engineers. Yeah, yeah give me an E. <laughs> OK. We'll get there, folks. By the end of this session, I promise you, we're all going to have a big group hug and then probably cry at the end. So we know it's been 20 years since DAB uh, went live in the UK and the 50% digital listening threshold. We know that that's been met. Internet streaming was not big 20 years ago, and now 5G is on the horizon. So what should the future actually be? So we've got a very good panel today. We've got a very good uh, uh, case studies happening today and good debate. So we're going to have uh, uh, a bit of a thought experiment, guys. We're going to imagine that we're, the only, we're only allowed to choose one option, DAB plus IP or 5G. Yeah, a <laughs> little bit of interaction, that's okay. Um, but can you imagine a world? So we're going to actually pretend, so come with me, come with me, folks. Monday morning, at the IET, Monday morning at the IET, let's pretend, okay, that we actually have a functioning government, <laughs> no matter where we are in the world, but we're in the UK, a functioning government that we can pass this legislation and we can transfer all of UK's radio output onto the new platform within the next five to 10 years. Can we imagine that? And then we get the matches out and set fire to all the transmitters. No, okay, just me? All right, so uh, we've got a team of three, uh, three teams of experts who are going to propose what these motions are. And then we want you guys to get involved and be adding in your questions and thinking of suggestions. So we're going to jointly create a big list of things that we know that we need to make it happen. And we're going to go march down to Boris's house and knock on the door and make it happen. And uh, in parallel to all this, the wonderful, super talented Kate Chappelle is going to be standing by taking notes. And then we're going to have a record of the conversation in a lovely um, illustrated form. So before we begin, there are a few rules. So the rules, drum roll please. No, that's good. We're, is anyone in Foley here for real? Like seriously? Okay, the rules are, so we know that this is a thought experiment. So just come with me, come into our mind, imagine that we have a functioning government, etc. The speakers don't necessarily believe that um, that we should be only picking one platform either. Um, and neither do their companies. So no misleading tweets about the BBC is going to be broadcasting on 5G or Quentin Howard doesn't like the internet because we know he does. That's right. Um, the same applies to the discussion afterward. Um, everyone is, is giving their personal opinions and not know those are their companies. So just show some respect. And we don't want anyone to get sacked. And then uh, we'll send around a copy of Katie's notes afterward for everyone. So we're going to have some fun and enjoy this and take part in some debate. So so to make the case for DAP Plus, please welcome our first speaker. Drum roll, please. Quentin Howard. Thank you. So we've, we've got to do some imagination here and think that this dystopian government we've elected have decided to close down everything except one platform for radio. And how do we migrate everybody to that platform? This is serious stuff, so I'm going to have to get serious here before I get this presentation going, because we've all got to crank it up to 11 or 7 <laughs> in my case. So that's what we're going to do, because this is how seriously we need to take the subject. So um, the challenge has been laid down. This is about the technical future of radio. The gauntlet has been laid, and we three are going to see if we can convince you uh, as to which is the right way to go and whether it is practical. We may or may not believe what we're about to tell you. So the case for DAB Plus, let me give you a quick history of DAB, first of all, because how did we get to DAB Plus is quite important. You go right back to 1981, and the German IRT decided to sit down and work out how to digitize, how to digitize radio. Um, and they didn't really get serious until a consortium formed together in 1987, the Eureka 147 Consortium, which was composed of the public service broadcasters, principally their research arms, uh, and they worked out 
probably for the first time, how to get a broadcast network to do reliable digital transmission. It preceded television, it preceded ADSL, it was the radio people, the DAB people, who invented what is basically in all of the following technologies. Uh, in 1990, I saw it in Atlanta at the NAB as a fully working demonstration, a really, really quick development time. It was the size of a bus, but it all did work. And I remember walking across the car park with Eddie Fritz, who was the president of the NAB at the time, and he said, Jesus, you Europeans are five years ahead of us Americans. We're going to have to catch up. We want to adopt DAB. That didn't work too well for them. Um, in 1992, there was an interesting moment that happened. I got called to a meeting uh, with some BBC engineers and Gray Allen, you might remember that too, and Roger Francis uh, and Peter Jackson and Derek Connolly from Hallam. We were all secreted in a little room together and in that little room, uh, the BBC said, we got to work with you, commercial radio, to make sure that digital broadcasting happens. Otherwise, it won't. Now, this was at a period when the BBC and commercial radio did not talk to each other and I take my hat off to Phil Laven at the BBC for having the courage to have that meeting because if he hadn't I don't think we'd be where we are today. Um, Derek Connolly, chief engineer of Radio Hallam, his son is Jarvis Cocker. I'm just thought I'd drop that in there. Um, it was in 1995 then that the Etsy standard for DAB was, uh, was released and I do recommend you go and have a look at that Etsy standard. It's a beautiful piece of writing. If you're into reading technology, read the Etsy standard 30401. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. It reads beautifully, and you'll understand DAB. I certainly did when I read it again last weekend. <laughs> uh, in uh, 95, we formed the uh, Eurodab, and that became Worldab in 1997. Uh, the first uh, broadcast started in June in 1995 in Norway of DAB, followed by the BBC's permanent, permanent in inverted commas, uh, network which started in September 1995 and the first commercial uh, DAB in the world is in 1996 actually in Birmingham which was an experiment that we did with Classic FM and BT where we were broadcasting audio and data so you can see it's kind of rolling quick, pretty quickly by then the momentum was really going 1996 was the Broadcast Act which made it all happen and for digital television as well and then in 1998, the first and only, I put that in inverted commas because it wasn't in the end, um, National Commercial Mux Digital One was awarded uh, by the Radio Authority. And then 20 years ago last week, uh, we put Digital One on air. Um, 2002, nothing much was happening until 2002 when we decided that we needed to make chips to go inside the radios to bring the price down to £99. And then the first mass market, Evoke, the wooden Evoke, which you're all familiar with, was launched in 2003. And for me, that's day zero of digital radio. Everything else before that was experimenting. But until there were cheap receivers, there wasn't a consumer market. So for me, that's day zero. Only two years later, the Koreans launched mobile television using DAB. They picked DAB technology to run mobile television. Uh, my screen's gone black. No, it's got. Thank you. Um, and then in um, 2006, uh, we thought, well, actually, DAB's OK, but not really taking off. What we need is a more efficient audio encoding technology. We need to update it. And so we launched DAB+. Six years before that, the World Dab Forum had had a look at putting MP3 on to DAB. And it wasn't that efficient. We didn't gain that much by doing so. But 2006, we launched a call for technologies. And the DAB standard was published nine months later. To get a standard published within nine months is phenomenal. Normally, it takes 18 months, sometimes two years. So to do it in nine months was phenomenal. That's why we got to DAB+. So how does it work? I'm not going to explain DAB. I'm going to get somebody with the two master's degrees uh, in engineering to do it, uh, Kate Bellingham. She was a presenter of Tomorrow's World, and this is from 1992. This transmitter here at Crystal Palace is 222 metres high, commanding enough to send out FM signals to a huge swathe of London and the southeast. Now, obviously, cars that are in direct line of sight of the transmitter can get good reception. But if there's a building or a hill nearby, the car can pick up a signal that's been reflected back off them as well. And as the two signals get mixed up, you get interference. Those whistles, whooshes, and crackles. Now, digital radio should get round some of these problems because the digital pulses can cope much better with being bounced around than the more delicate FM signal. But there is a price. 
Compact discs need about one and a half million digital pulses for every second of sound. Use that much for radio and you'd seriously clog up the airwaves. But there are ways of sending less digital information without hearing any difference. For example, if a loud sound and a quiet sound happen at the same time, if you're not going to hear the quiet one, you only need sent the loud one. In fact, using techniques like that, you only need sent one-fifth as much information and it should still sound the same. But what really makes digital radio viable is the way the signal's transmitted. And the equipment in here can pick it up. <laughs> on the screen just now are the FM signals. Each one of these spikes is a different station. That one's Radio 4, and further up there's Radio 1. But this is a digital test transmission. It's quite different. Instead of there being just one signal for each station, the sound from lots of stations is spread across about 1,500 digital signals, all bundled together. And this is the clever bit. Even if up to half of those signals are badly distorted by hills or buildings, a digital receiver can still untangle the original pulses to make CD-quality stereo sound. Well, using this, I can switch between the FM sound and the digital radio, so I think it's time to take it out on the road and hear what it actually sounds like. Now, this is FM. The hills around here in the Rygate area always cause a lot of problems, as you can hear. And this is the digital sound. You can almost smell Andrew. You sitting in the car. Let's listen to that again. There's the FM with all those whooshes and crackles. And that's the digital. So that's 20. Eight years, 27 years old, something like that, that uh, bit of film. Brilliant. Um, so that's how DAB works. There it is. Got all that? Fine. Uh, actually, let's break that down and make it simpler. On the right-hand side here is the bit that does the modulation, creating those 1,536 individual carriers, orthogonally positioning them. That means they don't interfere with each other. Coding them. That means you can recover errors. That's COFDM, called Coded Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplex. On the left-hand side there, in that box there, that's where the audio coding takes place. And that's the only bit we change for DAB+. So let's look at that a bit closer. On the top, the old DAB, MPEG-2 encoding, uh, some audio framing, shove it into the multiplexer. On DAB+, HEAACV2, MPEG-4 coding, uh, a super framing system because the frames on DAB were designed for 24 millisecond chunks. And this one, uh, AAC, has different size chunks. They get 20, 30, 40, and 60 millisecond chunks. So we make a bigger audio frame, 120 milliseconds, which fits into five frames on there. We add some reed solomon encoding around it to give it more redundancy. And bingo, you have a very good system for DAB. Um, it's about two and a half times more efficient in terms of audio coding. So you can get 24, typically, <laughs> stereo stations into a multiplex. Better transmission reception, the effect is to give you about a boost of equivalent of 1 or 2 dBs of RF power if you're comparing it to DAB. Uh, and cheaper transmission per channel, that's the real thing that makes it viable because it's now only 60% um, uh, uh, cheaper, 40% of the cost to transmit per channel. But of course, as everybody knows, the AMI is old-fashioned, they're not very good, they don't like it, no, 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 all the bloody time. This is, this is Chris Veck, uh, Dr. Chris Veck. He's the head of Deutschland Radio, uh, the national network in uh, Germany. Um, and he talks about the Shannon limit in an article which you can read in Radio World, in this month's Radio World, last month's Radio World. The well-known Shannon limit of 1948 specifies, basically, that if you want to transmit bits of information reliably, the more reliably you need to do it, the more bandwidth you need. And he says, right at the bottom here, there is no significant difference in performance between 5G modulation schemes compared to the still very robust DAB+. Both, limit, both systems, and including Wi-Fi and all those, all work pretty close to the Shannon limit. So when anybody says, you know, DAB not very efficient, just say to them, Shannon off. That's the technology. Remember that. You might need that for the quiz later. The Shannon limit was uh, done in 1948. Claude Shannon, brilliant, uh, lots of wartime work to work out how you digitize signals and the efficiency. 
worked with a chap called Harry Nyquist. You've all heard of the Nyquist theorem. And Ralph Hartley, J.R. Hartley, who wrote Fly Fishing. Uh, great, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> DAB is doing really well. We know that uh, DAB listening is now the more popular uh, method of listening to radio than FM. Um, and this is uh, what we've got to do to get DAB plus now. I've got two and a half minutes to explain this. So already in the UK, we have coverage of 97.3, I think it might be a bit more than that, 97.6% of the UK is covered with DAB population. There, BBC has 412 transmitters, Digital One has 163, SDL has 64 transmitters. You can see the problem there in that as you get closer to that 100% limit, you need loads and loads more transmitters. Road-wise, we've got 46,000 kilometres of UK roads covered with the DAB, and 93% of all new cars on the road have a DAB Plus radio in them. So actually, we're on the road already to DAB Plus. But to get to 99% coverage, we probably need about another 100 or so DAB Plus transmitters. Now, if I were building those, I wouldn't extend the BBC network and just add single-frequency network transmitters. I would build a network of DAB Plus transmitters to fill in those little white areas which had 24 radio stations on there, some of them BBC and some of them commercial. You'll see why in a minute. What about the receivers? We've got 40 million DAB receivers or DAB plus receivers in the country, and 65% of households claim to own one or more digital radio receivers. So how many of those 40 million are DAB plus? Because if we're going to convert everybody to DAB plus in a short pace of space of time, we need to know how many there are. What percentage of this digital listening happens only on DAB plus radios or DAB only radios? Difficult to know. But here's some work I've done uh, with a great consultancy called uh, Paquet de Cloupe, which is pack packet in French, uh, working out uh, <laughs> where we are. And I think that about 31% of all the radios are DAB plus in cars. Uh, of all the radios are in cars or all DAB+. Plus. Everything post 10 pretty well is DAB+. Plus. So it's this blue bit over here that's the problem. Radios pre-2010 and also the own brand radios, the Tesco's own brand, which are DAB only until fairly recently. But I think when you look at those 18 million old DAB radios, some of them are redundant, some of them broken, some of them scrapped, some of them are kind of in the third bedroom. I think there's about 5 million problem radios to sort out, not as many as perhaps you'd think. And of those uh, chunk of radios, they probably only account for even less of the listening. So actually, it's not an enormous problem, I don't think. So here's my grand switchover plan in 16 seconds. It's going to take longer. Uh, first of all, let's build 100 DAB transmitters to complete the UK coverage. And those would carry a mix of uh, commercial radio stations and BBC. Let's have an amnesty on DAB radios, allow people to bring their old DAB crap back and swap it for a new one, an Aladdin's lamp with a voucher scheme. We need about 10 million in-car adapters. That doesn't actually cost anything. And then we'll announce a D-plus day, which is the 22nd of November, sorry, 14th of November 22, 1922, because that's the 100th anniversary of the BBC, and it seems like a good day to do it to me. And this is how we'd then take the BBC's multiplex and re-farm it. So that's the BBC now with DAB. So the first thing we do in twenty so we do this in 2023 is we shut down Radio 3 and we replace it with because <laughs> the only people who listen to Radio 3 are university lecturers who are too stingy to buy their own CDs. <laughs> so, so we replace it with a nice good quality DAB plus Radio 3 and we put Radio 1, Radio 2 and Radio 5 live on there. The following year we go even further and we shut down some more stations and we replace those with some DAB plus versions of the BBC. But also, because I'm nice to the BBC, I'm putting BBC Cymru, Scotland and Northern Ireland on the national mux as well. And then by 2025, we've replaced the entire BBC with uh, 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 multiplex with uh, DAB plus. But then I go further. This is what the BBC have for their nations and regions. And then national commercial radio goes on there as well. And that means that about 25 national radio stations get 99% coverage. Not difficult to do, is it? Here's the costs. I reckon it'll cost about £51 million to do all that. You can have a look at this later if you want. Uh, what it does for the industry is really interesting, though. Our Kiva make a profit out of it. whoop de doo uh, the broadcasters get massive savings because they're going to start, A, switching their FM off. Sorry, Arkiva, but you know that's happening. Um, but they will also get advertising growth. whoop de doo they do well. And the retailers who sell DAB Plus receivers, they do really well. So everybody's happy. 
The cost to the punter, 20 to 50 quid. That's not much. It's about one month's 5G rental. <laughs> and we're done. So that's the future. 99.5% population, BBC D1 and SDN, SDL uh, substantially refarmed. FM and AM networks by then start to switch off. We need to save electricity, go green. Um, 60 to 80 national stations we'll have by then. 20 to 50 local choices, and then SSDAB coming in and fitting out the choice there. No subscriptions, no monthly rentals, no data bills, no network congestion, and no IT security. That's my plan. Next, please. <laughs> First of all, um, I love your American accent. I think you should own it. And uh, second of all, I live near Crystal Palace, and I'm never going to look at that tower uh, the same way ever again. Um, and third of all, the cow, winner, winner. Okay, guys, so we're going to crack on. And also, uh, we're watching uh, Katie Chappelle's lovely animations here. I think, are these available afterward? on all fine greeting card stores <laughs> and everything. So thank you, Katie, again. This is really, really cool. I've not seen that too much before. So to bring up, the, uh, to talk about the case for IP, please, drum roll, please. Second drum roll. BBC getting revenge, maybe. It's Adam Bowie. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, follow that then, eh? Right. Um, so I'm going for internet radio, and what I mean here is fixed line broadband because that's incredibly practical for listening to the radio all around the country. Um, we're in the IET, so let's look at some SI units and just make sure we know what we're talking about and uh, get our definitions. Um, streaming audio is mostly measured in kilobits, um, and then there's 8 bits in a byte, which is why 8,000 kilobits equals a megabyte, and uh, megabytes and gigabytes, to, you can see, and you get right down to zettabytes, which are just enormous. It's worth knowing because we're going to be using a bit of data, and some of these numbers will come up. Uh, assumptions. We said we're not doing broadcast, um, and we're not using 3G, 4G, 5G, or whatever. So... Um, Yep, that's great. Okay, we can live with that. Um, does lead to a slight practical issue with the 26.5% of the population who listen to the radio in cars. Uh, we're probably going to have to lose those. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, 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 don't worry about it. I mean, you know, they've got Spotify. Um, <laughs> uh, and some, you know, if you're listening on a train, on the train to work or something, yeah, bad luck. Okay, moving on. Oh, and we're just not going to too worry about the enormous uh, waste pile we're going to create of all these redundant radios. So just, just put those out of your head. Right, okay. So is it a viable option? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, internet speeds are getting really fast, right? We're up to 54. I found this amazing, but we are, as Ofcom tells us, 54 megabits a second um, in the most recent data. And that's kind of doubled in less than five years. So internet's getting fast. Uh, we've got smartphones. It's kind of plateauing. There's 20% of people who don't have them, but, you know, lots of people have got smartphones, so in this world, that's Wi-Fi at home. You can listen to the radio on. Uh, we've got smart speakers. Okay, it's only 20%, but it's kind of growing fast, and, you know, hey, it's Black Friday, everybody, so get your 30 quid uh, smart speaker from Amazon or wherever and soon. Case closed. I think I've done it. Yeah? Got eight minutes left. Good. All right, okay. Maybe not quite. About 10 years ago, there was a conference very similar to this uh, called Ready at the Edge, and a speaker came up and pointed out that 8 o'clock in the morning, which is when peak listening is, um, if everybody streamed the internet to listen to the radio, only about 4 million of the 17 million people listening could actually do it, and no one else would be able to use the internet for anything else at that time. 10 years is a long time, though, and um, I don't know... I, that's all I've got. I don't know the details of that. So I thought, OK, let's try and redo the sums given where we are. OK. First of all, 8 o'clock is still when most people listen to the radio. I think most people know that. That's why breakfast shows are important. That's about 15 million people these days listen to the radio at breakfast. About 1.5 million of them are streaming already. Great. So that leaves 13.3 13 13 million streams. And now we're kind of assuming everybody, the worst case, which is everybody's listening to different radio. In reality, of course, you put the radio on in the kitchen and everyone listens to it, that one station. How much data do you actually need? Well, 4K video is the big thing here. I mean, it, it, there's lots of numbers. These are just as kind of examples. Depends what kind of streams you want, but you might use up to 25 megabits a second for 4K video. Obviously, it drops right down into kilobits a second for uh, stereo audio. 160, okay, you could probably do more if your Radio 3 might need a bit more than that. You can 
do with less, but let's just call it 160. That's a nice number, AAC, so it's great. Um, how do you get it? Well, um, we're at the home. Fiber to cabinet, just so you know, just everyone's clear. That's probably what most people have got at the moment. That's kind of fiber optics to that green cabinet somewhere within a few hundred meters of your house, and then a couple of wires to where you live. Um, ideally, we'd all have oh, no graphics change. Um, it should be from the exchange. It should be fiber all the way to the premises. Fiber to the premises. Actually, in the UK, we're really bad. Oh, we're really bad at that. Um, and you're hearing a lot of talk about that, even in this election. Uh, only 4% of premises have got fiber all the way there. Uh, compare that to, say, the Far East, where it's much higher. And, that, and that's where you get those real sort of 300 megabits plus kind of speeds. There's also kind of issues where you won't bore people with these, but contention, if lots of people are using it, the same, maybe your bandwidth goes down. You're probably going to be OK for audio for this as peak usage. And we know there's always demand. For, there's, you know, however much internet you get, someone comes along and wants to use it all. Only last week, Google launched this new streaming service. You know, this is where you can play games. The, the games are played on a, in the cloud somewhere, and the images of the games are actually streamed to you. So you know, they want 25 megabits just to do that. And Netflix accounts for nearly 13% of all internet traffic as well. So it's video, you know, so, so the, you know, the data's being used. But what we really need to know is how much is available, bandwidth is available at any time. Can we really do this? Can we move everybody to, the, to fixed, brand, fixed broadband and, you know, not the internet crash? Let's do some dangerous maths. I say dangerous because I'm really mixing a bunch of methodologies here, just doing some stuff. So, you know, you wouldn't do this, but I'm going to anyway. OK, so we're assuming data rates of stations, 160 kbs a second. So that's about 0 0.07 gigabits of data an hour, if you work it out. Rajar says the average radio listener listens for 20 hours of, ra uh, of radio a week. So if it was all IP delivered, that's personally, you're going through 1.5 gigabits of, uh, gigabytes of data uh, or five uh, a week or 5.9 a month. The average UK household actually gets through 240 gigabytes of data a month. Which means uh, when you take the fact that there's 27.8 million households, according to the ONS, and 66.4 million people in the UK population, that's 2.4 household. So each household's going through 14 gigabytes of data a month in this world where we're all listening to the radio and we're all listening to something differently. Or about 6% of what you're already using. So suddenly, well, oh, maybe it's doable, this. Um, that's 134 petabytes of data. Uh, a month across the whole UK for all radio streaming. Might be a few people looking at their contracts, at radio stations, their contracts of, um, you know, with the very cloud services, how much that's going to cost them. But anyway, let's not worry about that. Um, what, what, is that a big number? I mean, it's, it sounds big. Um, so we've got 134 petabytes of data for the whole of the UK. Cisco says that by 2021, we'll be up to 10.6 exabytes. That's why I wanted those definitions. That's Bigger than petabytes, that's what you need to know, a thousand times bigger. So that means actually by 2021, four things say the same, internet radio would count for 1.3% of UK IP traffic. Netflix is already at 12, 13%. So seems doable, right? Um, and actually, just throwing forward there, you can see that by 2022, we're going to be using, the world is going to be using 4.8 zettabytes. A thousand times an exabyte. Um, that's kind of useful. Just put that in. It means within about five years, we've trebled the amount of data we're using globally. But all that seems to Jeff, we can do this, right? So, um, okay, still closed. Okay, I've got three minutes just to go through a lot, couple of little awkward things, but I'll just bring them out anyway. Um, only 93% of homes actually have the internet, and that's kind of plateaued a bit. So there's a few people who just don't have the internet, so they can't listen to the radio. Um, people who don't have the internet, well, they're likely to be the old, elderly, they don't have skills, they've got privacy concerns, they tend to be in lower socioeconomic groups. So we might be disadvantaging the least advantageous in society by doing this, but you know, hey. Um, there's some location issues as well. Um, if you live in rural Wales, or particularly in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland, you're probably just not going to be able to listen at all. Um, sorry. So in conclusion then, yeah, we can do this. We can do this, people. But we have, I mean, there's some awkward little things there about elderly and unemployed people and pensioners. I mean, you know, upsetting pensioners, that doesn't 
matter to anyone, does it? And yeah, I mean, in remote rural areas, that's a bit of an issue, but you know, hey, you live there. So um, yeah, I rest my case. Thank you very much. <laughs> So basically, you're dissing the cows and your grannies, but you know, that's okay, it's all there. So um, uh, to, we got one last little debate about 5G. So to convince us it's the future or whether it's not the future, drum roll please, drum roll please. Uh, please welcome to the stage Andrew Murphy and Simon Mason, but I think Andrew, you're going first. Yep. So, okay, well, there you are. <laughs> one more time, round of applause for Andrew, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mookie. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I'm Andrew. I'm from BBC Research Development. Um, why am I telling you about 5G and 5G broadcast? Well, it's really about getting all that fantastic content that we as an industry make onto the devices that people have in their pockets, on the smartphones, on the tablets, and of course, in those pesky cars and trains as well. So um, where are we now? Well, Savoy Place, you, you, you know that. But where are we in terms of 5G and 5G broadcast? So, Let's take a step back, and before I talk about 5G broadcast, let's talk about 5G. So um, a bit of pseudo maths for you on a Monday morning. So a mobile network, it consists of the radio access part, which is those sticks on hills, the wireless link between your phone and the, and the cell site, and the so-called core network. Um, that's the bit that really connects the network to the outside world, deals with the SIM card, authentication, security, all that sort of good, good stuff. So let's look at a 4G network first. That's uh, the technical name for 4G is LTE, the long-term evolution. So as you'd expect, it has the 4G radio and the 4G core. OK, quite simple. Um, what about 5G? Well, this is where the story starts to get a bit more complicated. So in terms of a so-called standalone mode, 5G has, as you might guess, the, the 5G radio and the 5G core, the 5G new radio, is the name for the, the physical layer in, in, in 5G. But there's another flavor of 5G, the so-called non-standalone non 5G. And under the umbrella of 5G, you can actually have a mixture of 4G and 5G technologies. So the networks that are rolling out at the moment across the, across the UK and lots of other parts of the world are actually a mixture of, they're really a 4G network, so you've got the 4G core, um, you've got the 4G radio, and then you've got the 5G new radio as a bolt-on. And that's really about giving you extra download capacity, extra f faster internet speeds for over-the-top streaming and that sort of thing. And it's the cost models of those that Simon's going to talk about in a minute in terms of, in terms of 5G. I'm just out of interest. Has anyone got a 5G phone, 5G contract? Hand, hands up. Um, oh, if, if, so a, a very small number of you. So um, that, that, to me, um, reflects the fact that 5G is at a very early stage. A lot of the sort of whizzy features that are promised for 5G um, around sort of super fast speeds, very low latency, um, the idea of quality of service, so we could use it for contribution, things called network slicing. None of that's there yet. We're, we're still at this very early stage. Um, and I think that's, that's an important, important thing, to, thing to note, that um, although there's a lot of hype and buzz around 5G at the moment, it's not a technology that's, um, that's very widely available um, yet. So where does 5G broadcast sit across that? Well, that sort of spans all of this, this mixture of 4G, this mixture of 5G technologies. And because it's broadcast, it's the idea of you send a signal out and it can um, serve lots of people at the same time. Um, it can help potentially with coverage and capacity issues because that's what we're worried about. We're worried about these, these, these peak audiences for, for radio at 8 o'clock in the morning. Will everybody be able to get the radio at the same time? And also, um, we want to make sure that the content's available as cheaply as possible to, to, to people on their devices. OK, so um, a bit of a trip down memory lane. Um, I've, I was here um, a couple of years ago talking about um, 4G broadcast. So um, back in 2017, the mobile industry got together and started looking at broadcast as a, as a thing in the, in the mobile standards. And they developed this catchy, catchy titled thing called FEMBMS. Ah, oh, very good, the, um, the acronym's there already. Um, and that was, that was a, big, a big deal for, for broadcast and broadcasters in the mobile industry within 3GPP because for the first time we got features like free-to-air, standalone networks, 100% broadcast, very large cell sizes into the mobile standards. Previously that is something that just, just hadn't, been, hadn't been entertained. So where are we going? A um, bit of a philosophical question for, for 10 o'clock on a Monday morning but um, in terms of 5G, um, what I can tell you is um, 
the 3GPP approach to, to 5G, 5G broadcast. So they've made this split in the, in the standards bodies between the so-called mixed mode and the so-called terrestrial broadcast mode. Again, lots of very catchy, um, catchy phrases to describe these things. So on the one hand, we have the so-called terrestrial broadcast mode, which is much more like a broadcast net that we're used to. Broadcast only, standalone sort of broadcast um, commissioned or um, broadcast network operator um, operated network, potential for receive only devices. And then we have the mix mode. So that's much more of a cellular network, much more of a MNO, mobile network <laughs> operator type thing. Your device is connected to the network. And on that device, um, across the same network, you can get a combination of over-the-top streaming, over unicast, your normal internet access, as well as broadcast. So bang right up to date, uh, 2019, and this work's going, going on at the moment. Um, we had colleagues out um, at the standards meetings last week. Um, what's happened is um, we've taken what happened in, in the release 14, this, these, these great improvements that were put into the standard, and we've gone back and done a, a study to say, well, what are the, the so-called 5G requirements for broadcast? And there are a number of gaps that are identified. So improved mobility, so up to 250 kilometers an hour, really large scale networks. So the idea of a 100, cell, uh, 100 kilometer cell radius. So it's, it's a bit of a misnomer that 5G is necessarily all about lots and lots of small cells. There is the option there to have these, these big cells um, and various other improvements as well. We did a study, if you're interested in the details, it's a, it's a fascinating read. And um, that study is currently being turned into the, into the technical standards that are due to be um, completed in, in, June, in June 2020. So that's on the 5G sort of terrestrial broadcast track. Um, but as it says there, it's LTE based. It's, it's on the 4G radio. So just, just hold, hold that thought for a moment. Now, the other thing in terms of where we're going is um, trying to find out what the technology can really do. So we've been doing trials and tests of, of the technology. Most recently, we've, we've literally just finished something called 5G Rural First, which was um, a trial we did um, with members of the public, recruiting members of the public, putting um, 4G and 5G broadcast technology into their hands um, and seeing how they, um, how they got on with it. So this is where I need my need my hat because we were based up in the Orkney Islands on an island called Stronzi and I can assure you that the weather is not always as, as nice as it is in that photo. Um, so we as I say we got we got 20 members of the public we put 4G broadcast capable phones in their hands that there, there, there weren't any 5G broadcast capable handsets available but we deployed the technology in a way that we could try and simulate some of the features we'd like to see in, fi in the 5G broadcast so the idea of free to air we gave people unlimited data um, uh, and we had our own spectrum as well, so it was our own kind of standalone dedicated network. Um, and I think coming up next is a short video which um, will explain it far better than I can. So we're here on Stronzi in Orkney. To get here, we had to take a flight from London up to Aberdeen, then another hop on from Aberdeen to Kirkwall and finally a ferry to reach the island of Stromsey. We have a beautiful island here and we're trying to encourage more folk to come here. At the moment we have very poor internet connection. Some folk it takes them about 10 minutes to download an email. Studying with the Open University can be a challenge getting online um, to do the live seminars and things. That can be a struggle. And you can imagine if you're trying to make a living through using the internet, that's just not possible here. So we're here as part of the 5G Rural First project, and the aim of the project is to look at delivery of broadcast radio services over 5G. So we're in the loft at Stromsey Junior High School, and this is the base station. Cloud that have now installed the aerials. So ideally, we'll get to the point where we have the phones working with the radio services on them and people getting internet on them. But to get from where we are now, to get to that point, it's going to be a challenge, I think, let's just, let's just say. But we've got a good team of people on the case, so hopefully we'll be all right. Well done. <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you. So we're, we're still analysing the, the results of that trial, um, but we carried out some audience research and um, the response was overwhelmingly very positive. Um, people really appreciated having the convenience of, of radio on their smartphone, um, which previously they hadn't, they hadn't had access, access to. Uh, the other part of the project was really to try to um, go beyond what you can get with commercial equipment. So we've developed our own transmitter and receiver. It's based on this, this FE and BMS standard, but we can roll it forward to the, to the release 16, the absolute latest um, specs as they're being written at the moment, and we're working on that now. Uh, so what's missing? Well, very, very quickly, um, release 17, um, as one release in 3GPP ends, inevitably another one, another one rolls into view. Um, there's work going on on the core network side. There's a study underway to see how broadcast and multicast can fit into that. There's discussion about whether Release 17 will also um, handle the radio access network as well. But if it does, it will be on this so-called mixed, mixed mode. Um, what are the challenges? Well, um, if we're going to make this happen, a lot of the technology fundamentals are in place and there are further enhancements come to, uh, to come. But we, we, we still need to carry out um, some larger scale trials of the, of the technology. Where we were on Stronzi, we're a, a single transmitter on an island. We'd like to roll it out to the in-car environment, look at more immersive, personalised radio experiences. And of course, there are a huge number of issues around, around the sort of commercial questions. In terms of chipsets, handsets, network deployments, there's a, a new group that started, a new association called the 5G Media Action Group. Um, and that, the idea of that is to bring broadcasters, um, manufacturers, network operators together to try to see how media um, can be addressed in 5G. And although I've talked a lot about uh, distribution, obviously, we shouldn't forget that um, 5G, there's a lot of potential um, for production uses as well. And did the EBU are doing a lot of good work there around getting the requirements into, into 3GPP. So that's all I had to say. That's, um, that's something around the, the, the case for 5G. And I'll hand over to Simon to talk about, um, talk about cost modeling. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Andy. So uh, I have to say that the video that Quentin showed was a trip down memory line. I was the lab engineer who, uh, uh, 28 years ago, sat in that lab at Kingswood putting that demo together for Tomorrow's World. So that was uh, a trip down memory lane. OK, I'm, I'm not actually going to take a position. I'm just going to give you lots of facts and uh, about a comparison of 5G Unicar, so that's the way we use 5 or 4G as we use it now for the delivery of radio, and compare that to FM and DAB and using the, the DAB Plus case that, that Quentin uh, had suggested. So last year we um, uh, hired some really good test equipment uh, from, uh, from Roden Schwartz and we went and analysed the best 4G network we could possibly find, which was EE. EE had invested one and a half billion in their overlay of, of 4G and we went and drove many, many kilometres of the UK motorways and their urban and suburban environments. And exactly as was described earlier, as soon as we went anywhere rural, it fell over. You know, so if you do live in, in, uh, in, in rural parts of the UK, unfortunately, this is, this is not an overlay for you. And we went and analysed this and looked at it. And actually, the only time it ever fell over, it delivered incredibly well for radio. Um, in terms of very well constructed players, large buffers in the player. So every time there was a, uh, a, a glitch in coverage or a glitch in capacity, the player just rolled through it and actually we had very, very little audio disturbance. The only time we got audio disturbance was in traffic jams. And I just really want to show you the, the reason for that. And we analysed uh, the number of cells we typically drove through. So a colleague here drove from our uh, offices in Winchester uh, through, through to Leicester, and he went through nearly sort of a, a 140 base stations. And so the bigger cells he drove through were typically about three kilometres in length. So we analysed one of these three kilometre cell sizes. And so this is what we did. So we, we assumed three, three lanes in the jam, and we got this uh, uh, information. So typically jams are made up 80% cars, 10% vans, 10% lorries. We got that from the highways agency. And uh, so there's about 1,800 vehicles in the jam. And because we just assumed that EE had got a third of that business, so there's 600 vehicles in, on the EE network, EE have got the best spectrum. 
you know, just by the way they've been merged over the years. And they've got a lot of spectrum at 1800, which works very, very well in this sort of cell size. And we've got a model now which shows that the, because there's lots of different modulation schemes in LTE, we've got a model which can tell you the sort of average throughput you'll get through from a cell if you did distribute lots of users across the cell. So we assumed that there was going to be 50%, uh, it was at drive time, 50% of the people listening to the radio, and about 7%. And this is, you know, you can play with the model and choose different values, but we chose 7% watching video. So 300 radio streams, 42 video streams, and what was the outcome? It crashed, okay? The network crashed, and it's not radio that destroys these, these, these cells, it's video, even that small amount, 7% seven, uh, 7 42, it's the video that really drives the capacity up and pulls these networks, these networks down. So, uh, moving on. Uh, so, 4G, 5G unicast works really, really well. And what I mean by unicast is Back in the CDN, there is one stream generated for every user. It works really, really well, except when we get into, into rural environments. Large buffers in the players is a really good design. So guys, if you're designing players, make sure you have this large buffer. The BBC's buffer, we, we see delays between 60 and 90 seconds, depending on whether it's a, an iOS uh, or, or, a, or another underlying system. And, but it's always video consumption that pulls down the cell, not radio. So 4G, 5G is, is in unicast mode, is perfectly capable of delivering radio services. But as we've talked already, the consumer pays for the data, and we've talked about the poor and the older people in our society, and it's a huge investment. You know, EE have spent this one and a half billion to overlay 5G, they're probably going to spend similar numbers and they've got to get a return on that. And that return has to come probably from the consumer. And we've seen that these base stations are stressed when, it's, when they are heavily used. So it's not a perfect delivery mechanism, but it's not bad, except when we get to really into, into the rural areas where there is no coverage at all. So we're now going to compare it to three other, to two other uh, technologies. So we're going to look at it in a delivering uh, to multi-million listeners. That's the, we're gonna do FM, DAB and IP and we're gonna look at the, the target service area is London. We're gonna assume that all the listeners are, when we look at FM, we're gonna assume all the listeners are on FM, all the listeners are on IP, all the listeners are on DAB. Um, and we're going to assume that when they're at home, it's over broadband and when they're uh, out and about, it's on the mobile phone networks, and we're gonna assume they're perfect. So there's no, there's no impairment. You know, if you pull a stream, you will get a stream. Um, and we're not going to include, when we look at the IP streaming, the, the, what the consumer pays. We're not gonna add in the, uh, the, the cost of the broadband contract of the mobile phone. It's purely what the broadcaster pays. So firstly, for the, for the, for the FM, we've assumed that the, the, the this person who owns the broadcast license is renting from a network operator uh, access to, to a, a, an antenna and, the, and the, 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 transmitter, uh, the transmitter at the bottom. For the, for the DAB, we're gonna assume it's, a, it's an eight uh, transmitter multiplexing uh, uh, system. And there is a middleman, and I've just made some assumptions about what the multiplex operator does in terms of marking up what the transmission operator does, and then it's divvied. I've assumed 25 DAB plus services in this case, and is then divvied up between that number of services. We're going to assume that 5% of the population of that service area listen to that particular radius, so 5% penetration. And using RAJAR, we've sort of assumed that about 2.2 radio stations is sort of average what people listen to. 21 hours a week is, uh, is, the, is the number of hours. So I've used 10 hours per week per, per user is because what we've got to do is we've got to convert this to make it a fair comparison with IP is the cost per hour. And that's what we're trying to drive down in terms of these calculations. So 5% listeners, 10 hours a week, okay, and we're just, as we've said already, the IP network is absolutely perfect. So for the FM, I've used Croydon, and it serves 8.5 million people at uh, 15%. So that's what we've used for FM. For DAB, eight transmitters, 25 DAB+. Plus. It serves 10.1 million people at 15 plus, and we'll just, we'll, when you see the calculations, this is all taken into account. So for FM, we've assumed the, rate, the rental 60K. 
8K approximately to get from studio to transmitter, so 68K total, 8.5 million people served, and you can see the maths, and it drops down to 0 0.0003 of a pound per hour listened. So that's, that's what we're going to, going to use as our reference for FM. For DAB, we do exactly the same com, uh, calculation. So 800,000 for the network, uh, divide by 25. We get 32K for each of the DAB plus slots, 8K to get, get from studio to, to the multiplexing center. And so we build the costs up. And that comes out at 0015 per hour for DAB. And then for IP, um, IP, uh, the CDN costs we could see vary between about 0 0.02 of a gigabit shifted to about 0 0.08 uh, for a gigabit shifted. So I've taken the lower number uh, in terms of, of this calculation. And because you've got this origin server and the connectivity, uh, I've just divided that by the number of DAB hours. So just to make this, co this comparison, and you can see that comes out at 0 0.004. So just comparing those three numbers, it comes out that IP is the most expensive to reach that sort of audience, about two and a half times that of DAB, and FM is about twice the cost of DAB. If your finance department may not be as good at negotiating with the CDNs and you've got it at 0.4, uh, uh, IP is about five times the cost of DAB. So that just really gives you the numbers to be able to, 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 do, to do that comparison. All right. And that's me finished. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. So I'd like to invite all our speakers back on stage, please. Very good. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna start a little bit of brawling now. So we're gonna get out get out the the five Gs, the IPs, the DBs. Don't be shy, gentlemen. Gentlemen, come on forward. So a quick straw po show of hands. Who do you think is winning here? Hands up, DAB plus. Ooh. Hands up, IP. Okay. <laughs> Come on, you've got a vote as well. <laughs> okay, hands up, 5G. Okay, interesting. Or is it? Do you guys have anything uh, just to kind of kickstart a little bit of a fun bants, live bants on stage? Do you have anything you want to rebute against each other? Well, 5G yes, standards. Yes, thank you. You first. 5G yeah. standards haven't actually been set yet. The 5G that you've got at the moment is only running on 4G. And only provides 20% more capacity on the 4G networks, about that. So it's not actually, it's 4.2G really, isn't it? Not even 5G yet. We are going to hug this out afterward, by the way. Okay. Yeah. So just, just thought I'd lay that down, because when you publish a standard, when's your standard next year? Uh, for the first part of the five, yeah, yeah. the first part. Then the they've got to make the chips, then they've got to get the receivers out there. It's going to take a long time. We'll all be dead by then. So <laughs> we... <laughs> Happy Monday, motivation. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag RadioCon. Um, so remembering, we are talking about the future of the radio. So you know, we, we are like, you know, dreaming, dreaming of our perfect government that can help us find these solutions within the next five years. But a quick one for IP and 5G. Like, what exactly do we need to do? So I, I, I think we're in a real quandary. If, mm. I, if I'm honest, you've got a, a younger generation who, you know, if all the data we believe are not listening to the radio and are wedded to their, their mobile devices. The real conundrum for me is how do you get really high quality broadcast technology into those devices with prominence so the broadcasters mm. can be discovered? That for me is the critical question. It isn't actually the underlying technology, it's mm. how we get good quality broadcast content onto mobile devices. Okay, what do you think that killer content could be? Well, I, I think we've already got the killer content. It's mm. just getting it there so it can be discovered. And I think that's what we're all trying to understand and, and, and trying to crack in this discussion and debate. Okay, and how far, what's realistic then? What, in terms of time scale? Mm. Or, well, I mean, I think we're talking a good few years yet. But I mean, as Simon says, it, it, we, 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 need to get the, we need to get this great content into those devices because yeah. without that, 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 those are the devices that everyone has in their, has in their pocket. So that's right. absolutely crucial. And, and the technology, it sort of doesn't matter as long, as long as we're there. And from the BBC's perspective, you know, that content needs to be easily discoverable, widely accessible to everyone that pays, yeah. pays the licence fee. So 
Exactly. Um, it, it's got to be available <laughs> everyone for everyone. Everyone in this room, right? And, and IP, like, what, what do we need to do on, I, as far I as mean, I mean, I mean, I everyone else, I think it's, you know, do kids have radios today? And if they don't, what do they do? And what are they listening on? And you've also got this whole kind of living in an ever more personalised world. So what's uh, broadcast radio's place in that? It's really interesting seeing the number of different Dad Plus services, actually, that have been launching with ever more honed and slightly niche services mm. that the big broadcasters are coming out and that's kind of I suppose analogous to you choosing <coughs> a different Spotify streams or whatever because that 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 that's really what what, what the, the fight is about yeah. really and mass market audiences and you know drawing away from everyone's listening to something different to what brings people together because that's mm. what radio can do mm, and, exactly and, and, and the, the point about um, the radio is interesting because that's where most people discover new music still. Uh, Connor McNicholas, who happens to be my nephew, was the editor of NME. And he's really worried by Spotify because what Spotify does is because its algorithms are self-serving, they gradually narrow you and narrow you towards a kind of music which is what everybody thinks they want to listen to. Yeah. So actually it cuts out the discovery of other music. So those kind of algorithms on streaming music services don't do what the John Peels of radio did. And no. that's what we're missing out. So getting, and, and it comes back to Simon's point, is getting yeah. a device into, into people under 25, into their hands, that allows them to discover music, music, not just have more of what they've already got. Right, so a combination of internet and 5G and all kinds of things. So now this thought experiment continues. I'm gonna throw it over to you guys, literally, but just a quick reminder, these things are lethal. They will, <laughs> knock your teeth out if you do it the wrong way. So we're going to underarm toss this, right. So who's got the first question? Oh, front row, easy. OK. Sorry, Anne told me I should ask questions. So uh, I'll be a bit devil's advocate, if, if you don't mind. So in 2002, I was on the team that launched Six Music, one of the first DAB radio stations, which was obviously brilliant for me because I kept my house. Uh, and. Uh, Anyway, uh, this year my car got written off, and I like to keep my cars for a long time. So I got a new car, and 17 years after launching that station, I finally got a DAB radio in my car, which was amazing because I could listen to that radio station I worked for 17 years ago. And um, there was a whole host of other radio stations. There were lots of commercial stations. Some of them were even in stereo, a couple of them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, th I think about my day now, I work, I'll, you know, declare my interest, I work delivering audio over IP. Uh, I wake up in the morning, I've got a DAB radio by my bedside, that's because I won it in a pub quiz. Um, I go downstairs, I tell Alexa to play Radio 6 music, and then my kids tell it to play something else. And then when we're driving around in the car, I do listen to the DAB Plus radio station. It has almost half the radio stations I listen to regularly. So it doesn't have NPR, it doesn't have FIP from France, it doesn't have uh, you know, Radio Paradise from California. So in terms of the choice, it's not everything I want to listen to. In terms of the sort of coverage, it's pretty good, except in Cornwall, where it drops out. Uh, my kids in the back, my daughter's listening to Billie Eilish and surfing Instagram and my son is watching YouTube videos of people crashing things. Uh, so That's your car got written off. Yeah, yeah. It was, well, not you got, strictly You've got 40 related. seconds left for the question. Yeah. Just yeah. So, so, <laughs> Thank you. So Thank you. I, I think, you obviously yeah, have time. What I'm trying to do is set the scene. I think, I think the option is do nothing, and IP and uh, mobile IP will just win because that's what the next generation is doing. I mean, I, I don't think anybody here would actually disagree that it isn't a single platform world. It is a multi-platform. Uh, and it will be a mixture of DAB and DAB+. Plus. Uh, I would like to see us move to DAB+, plus quicker. I think we can if we have the balls to do it. Uh, but at the moment, the bull has it. Um, uh, but it will be on mobile devices. It will be IP. It will be Alexa. It will be all sorts of devices. You know, the, the, the difficulty for the broadcasters is they're going to have to pay for more platforms. And it's just going to become yeah. more expensive to reach more and more smaller audiences. That's the struggle we've really got as broadcasters. Right. It all goes back to yeah, the bowl. It goes back to that. No bowl. Right. So we have time for one more question. And we're going to... Oh, underarm. Underarm. Stand up. Underarm. Underarm. He's not... Okay. Okay. There we go. Good. Good. There we go. Round of applause. That throw's got a bigger round of applause than any of us up here, by the way. So, like. 
Thank you, sir. We have a very short amount of time, so go for it. Okay, right. 4G, MBMS, been in there since, since quite a long time. Why aren't we using it? Why are we waiting for 5G? Well, there have been, uh, it's, it's, all, it's all the same issues, I suppose, that there have been around any, any new technology. It's the handset availability. Um, I guess it, it, there's, a, there's a sort of difference of interest, isn't there, between the, the, the mobile network operator, which the model there is you, you have a subscription, you, you, you pay monthly, whereas the, the sort of latest EMBMS, the sort of um, the FE MBMS gives you the idea of a free-to-air, a sort of broadcaster network. Um, so the, the, there are all these sort of different, different incentives in the industry that I guess need to, the stars all need to align to, 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 make, to make this happen, so, so and, think, and that just hasn't happened yet. Yeah. So I think EE did use it. They used it at Wembley. They used it significantly. Mm -hmm. I I think, what, I think what's going to happen is when we get smart RAN, so that's, the, that's where this will move forward, we can use the spectrum that we're using in the broadcast modes when it's not required, because it's actually not very often is there such demand in a, in a location for all the same content. We can then use it for supplementary downlink, and then, when, and then the smart RAN allows us to do that. We switch it on for supplementary downlink, and then when there is that demand in the network for broadcast, we can flip it and use it in the broadcast mode. Those are the sorts of models. But there's, it's, it's an economics question, because you have to then do it one-to-one -one with an MNO, with a bro bro and actually there's four or five MNOs. It's really difficult commercially. And potentially there's regulatory issues. Yeah. Spectre, there's all there's a, a huge wave of, of issues, potentially. Yeah. 5G fixes that. Well, the, the smart RAN does. Yeah, that's the key. Whether it's 4G or 5G, it's the smart RAN that fixes it. But you've, you've still got... If, you can persuade, if the broadcasters can persuade the 5G operator to carry their signal. Exactly. You, you've st you've still got the handset availability, you've still yeah. got the economic questions and the who's going to pay for the network deployment, all, all those sort of things. So the technology in itself, you know, 5G's build is fantastic technology that's going to, going to give us fantastic speeds everywhere, but somebody's still got to pay for the roll-up of that technology. Yeah. Um, so that is wrapping up our first session. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, more round of applause for the gentlemen. You guys are going to be around all day today? Okay. And I was going to have him do like 11 seconds sell to the government, but we're going to do that. So uh, keep the round of applause going. Back, David. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.